I uh, became interested in the topic of genetics, I guess. When I was 15, I did a science experiment called polyploidy in plants, and I polyploided seeds by, adding a, by putting them in a chemical, which multiplied the chromosomes, and I also uh, treated them with radiation, which multiplied the chromosomes. And so I grew the plants out. I was 15, I was in Cincinnati, Ohio, and the control plants that weren't treated looked normal, and the polyploided plants were bigger and looked deformed. And um, I, I looked at these two things and I thought, these I would eat, these I would not eat. And I won first prize in the Cincinnati Engineering Society Science Fair. And it also uh, made me realize that I wanted to keep up with what they were doing to food, what science was doing to food, because I felt if I could make these really obvious changes in my bedroom when I was 15 years old, then scientists were going to be doing all kinds of things, and I wanted to keep up with it. Because my instinct was I didn't want to eat the, the, the plants that were looked overly, they were sort of overly developed and deformed and thick, and, and really didn't, didn't look like that was the kind of food that I wanted to put in my body. So I'm actually a great believer in instinct and using our intuition to decide what we want to eat and what we don't want to eat. And that's always put down by promoters of these, you know, super high-tech um, um, regimes. But I think that we're here because our ancestors looked at certain foods and thought, you know, I don't want to eat that, I do want to eat this. So um, I think that uh, we as citizens can inform ourselves, but also if you get a sense that that's not the right thing to do, I think it's, it's actually perfectly okay not to do, not to go along with that. Um, then in 1970, when I was in college, I became a vegetarian as part of the whole, you know, hippie back to the land thing. And before that, I had had um, headaches and insomnia. I had a great life, but I had headaches and I had insomnia pretty much every day. And I'd go to the doctor and they'd say, how are you? And I said, well, I'm fine, but I get a headache every day about, you know, four o'clock and I have insomnia. And they said, oh, okay. They never asked me what I ate. You know, not ever. So as when I gave up junk food and white flour and white sugar and started eating mostly vegetables and stopped eating, you know, cheeseburgers and Cokes and <laughs> French fries, I felt so much better. My headaches went away and my insomnia went away. So I became very interested in food and health and food and social justice issues and started informing myself. It became a great interest of mine. And then that same year I started making films. So I always wanted to join these two great interests of mine and make a film that organic is the way. That, that's organic is the way. So I made all different kinds of films and then around the year 2000 I decided I would make that film on organic food and organic agriculture and how this is really a better way to, uh, for us to conduct our, our whole um, food regime. And um, a friend of mine said, do you know about genetic engineering? Do you know they're genetically engineering seeds and crops? And I, I had no idea. I knew what recombinant DNA technology was because I lived in the Bay Area in the 70s. That's where they discovered it, where they take apart, basically they sort of take apart a gene and recombine it with new things that wouldn't be there naturally. That's why it's called recombinant DNA technology. And I had no idea they were doing that. So the sh focus of the film went from basically just agriculture to this really radical change that they were making in the food system that no one knew about because I was highly educated uh, about my food. I was living in, uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area where they have the best food in the world, where I could eat organic food. I was like, and I didn't even know what they were doing. It was totally under the radar. So, so I decided to make the film that became The Future of Food. And so what I'm going to do today, this f film came out 15 years ago, and so, uh, t actually, no, 12 years ago, but I started making it 15 years ago. So what I'm going to do today is go through the film and talk about what's the same and what's changed. What has panned out in terms of the promoters of, of genetic engineering in agriculture? What's panned out and what hasn't? Because uh, the system, and the, good, the thing about this film, I think, which makes it unique in a lot of the... It, when I started making this film, no one was talking about food system, no one was talking about a food movement, um, and I didn't know if anybody would even want to see it. I just wanted to make it. But when it came out, it was very, very popular. It was, you know, we did this kind of grassroots distribution, and it was just extremely popular, and it showed in conferences and conventions, and, and when, then um, it was 
the activists were using it all over the place. They were trying to stop GE, and they would order, you know, 100 copies at a time. And I did all self-distribution. And so then um, it was accepted by Film Forum, which is one of the, I guess, it's sort of one of the two top independent theaters in New York City, that they would premiere it in New York City, which was a great honor. And she said, well, you're not showing the DVD. You're not selling the DVD. And I said, well, actually, I'm selling hundreds of DVDs because the activists want it all over the world. And she said, well, you have to stop selling it until the premiere. And so we had to stop selling it and everyone was calling us and saying, you have to sell it, we have to see this, we have to see this. So I called up the woman who runs Film Forum and I said, you know, everybody wants to see this film, so can we move the premiere back a few months, you know, rather, because they usually have six months. I said, can we move it back so we can just get this premiere over with so I can start selling it again? So we managed to move it, move it back so it, so it actually opened uh, more quickly in New York, and then she let me sell the DVDs again, which was really great, because it helped um, mobilize what became the food movement. Um, so basically, what was happening then is the same thing that's happening now, is the, G the promoters of GE have, um, they have three things that they say about GE, which is, that <laughs> which is, um, sorry, that's me, <laughs> uh, which is that it's exactly the same as traditional breeding. We've been doing this for thousands of years. And um, actually, if you use the terminology genetically modified, it's true that we have been genetically modifying crops for thousands of years, because if you cross one kind of wheat with another kind of wheat, you're actually modifying it. But they, it's not been genetically engineered. You're not bringing new pieces of DNA in, that you wouldn't have in nature. So they say it's exactly, it's been, uh, it's traditionally been doing it for thousands of years. It's been thoroughly tested, and as you'll see, it hasn't been thoroughly tested at all. Um, and then the third one is we need it to feed the world. And I think of these, the most insidious one is we need, we need to feed the world because there are so many problems in the world now and people are so overwhelmed and even people that would call themselves progressive or liberal, you know, they just don't want to have to think of another problem. And so they say, oh great, we need to feed the world, case closed, I don't have to think about that again. And I think that that, that is the most insidious thing because when you actually look at it and you look at the studies that have being, been done and you look at the results of this which has been out for 20 years, they've actually been shown that the, the GM crops actually yield less. In fact, uh, in, in Europe, they have higher yields than they have here, and Europe uh, doesn't, have, doesn't grow GE. So I think that is, that is the thing that people really need to examine. And most of the genetically engineered crops in the United States, corn and soy, feed um, cows and cars. They don't feed people. They feed cows and cars. In fact, we've had, there's been a lot of talk, I know, in this conference about, about that and eating meat, and I, I still don't eat meat. And then the, what they say also is that people who are against the genetic engineering regime are, are guilty of crimes against humanity because they're going to um, make babies in Africa starve. So this is the crimes against humanity. In the United States, people who are against genetic engineering are really vilified scientists and stuff. So I want to give an example of a criminal... Here's a French, um, here's an Italian um, anti-GMO poster with her bunnies and her, so this is, a, um, this is someone who's against GE in Italy, so you can see it's really changed from the typical anti-GMO person, which they always have being, you know, skinny with, you know, knobby knees and Birkenstocks and crazy hair and they're wild and blowing up things, but here this nice lady is dressed like an Italian <laughs> woman with bunnies and in her lovely garden. And then this is also what's happening in Europe and many places all over the world. OGM, that's what they call GMOs, and Italy is giving it a boot in the grain. So that's, uh, that's what they think of it in most countries of the world besides here. So what we'll do now is um, go through the film. But first, one other thing I want to mention is this whole idea of science. Is, is Science is from the Latin word sciera, which means to know. So science is about what we know. And when they say that people who are against GMOs are against science, um, they're, actually, uh, they're actually taking a non-scientific position because the exact thing what we need is to bring science to the whole regime of genetic engineering to see uh, is it healthy for people? Is it healthy for animals? Is it healthy for the environment? Is it healthy sociologically? 
Is it healthy for communities to give up their traditional grains and take on uh, Monsanto's genetically engineered corn, for example? So I think that this idea that um, genetic engineering is science, genetic engineering is a technology that we used science to create. So there's two things, technology and science. And if you're against a technology, it doesn't mean that you're against science. Um, nuclear bombs were developed by using science. It doesn't mean that we have to use it. So I think that's something that we need to think, and think um, about really carefully. I also uh, say that as a filmmaker, my philosophy is smarten up, not dumb down. And I think that um, people who just say, trust me, it's great, or trust me, it's horrible. Um, I, I think that it's important for people to understand how these systems work, that you can have an understanding, and then you have knowledge, then you develop wisdom, and then you can be motivated to take action, whatever it is, even if it's buying a different kind of food, planting a different kind of garden, supporting local farmers, any of those kinds of things. So I'm all for that. <laughs>